Angelou said, when you know better, do better. This may be why so many in our community are struggling financially, because we have been taught better. The National Endowment for Financial Education, or NEFI's recent survey of LGBTQ plus people found that nearly half of the respondents to its study said they haven't had the opportunity to take financial education courses or training anytime, anywhere. So today we're talking with Dr. Bill Lee Hensley, the president and CEO of NEFI, about this study and how the financial services industry and the queer community can change these stats and turn our financial lives around. You're listening to Queer Money episode 360. Let's get on with the show. Welcome, Dr. Hensley, to the Queer Money podcast. We're looking forward to having you. Mm, Thank you. Me too. So could you would you mind giving, um, in your own words, uh, as the president and CEO of the National Endowment for Financial Education, what is the National Endowment for Financial Education, otherwise known as NEFI? So we're a private operating foundation, and that just means we're a public charity. And we have an endowment. So it's our, our money in the bank, if you will, our investments, and then uh, what that investment produces essentially informs our budget. So if you think of people who give grants, that's what we do, but we do it in a different way. We actually manage a lot of our own charity instead of just sort of writing the checks, writing the grant checks. We do some of that, but we actually manage our own work as well, the advocacy work, research, um, and We do that because we were originally the College for Financial Planning many, many, many years ago. So if you've ever had a CFP on uh, your podcast, or if you know CFPs, and I'm sure you know many of those, um, (laughs) that that started actually in Colorado, where NEFI is in Denver. Uh, And for about 20 years, it was the college. The the NEFI was formed as the parent. Um, And so we sold the college in in the late 90s. And now we just do the charity work, uh, the, the public service work, if you will. Right. And you all do a lot of work and do a lot of research, one of which we're going to talk about today, um, National Endowment for Financial Education's LGBTQIA plus experiences and financial education services survey. That Mm. is a mouthful. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But obviously, it's very personal for David and me uh, and our audience because uh, we're obviously heavily involved in queer money. So why did uh, the National Endowment for Financial Education conduct this survey? Well, first of all, I'm embarrassed we didn't do it before now. Um, you know, we we do a lot of public opinion polling and survey data, as well as sort of empirical. You know, when you think of like, you know, uh, uh, nerdy researchers from universities, this is what I am. Uh, we do that kind of research as well. But really, the precipice of this was that I'm on the CNBC Financial Wellness Council. And CNBC asked me last year in 21 during Pride Month um, to write something for them. And I said, I don't have any data. And I, you know, as a gay man myself, I was really embarrassed that we hadn't really sort of explored this or or asked these questions. Uh, So we tried to find data to write this this blog post. There were a few things out there. It was mostly very dated or it was hard to get to, hard to vet. And so we said, we're the, the fin ed data people, let's do it. And so we planned, you know, throughout the next year and we, we collected the data in the spring of 2022 so that we could launch all of the information during Pride Month. Nice. It's wonderful. It, it's actually very interesting. The uh, pr- uh, impetus for the study that we conducted with the Motley Fool um, this year, pretty much the same exact story. They mm. were asking us questions for an article that they were writing mm-hmm. two years ago, and we started commiserating about how there's just a dearth of data on the community. Mm-hmm. Prudential, uh, mass, mass Mutual have done a couple of great studies. There are a couple mm-hmm. other studies out there, but it's hard to find. It's few and far between. And it's, are we, it's hard to capture trends. Are we improving? Are things getting worse? Whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of exactly the same story for why we c- c- created our study. So um, I think it's great that that you, you and CNBC decided to do this because mm-hmm. we need much more data. It's hard to hard to talk about queer money and the direction that we're going if we don't know more. And mm-hmm. like every study that's done... There's just tons of studies done on the general population, all other demographics. Right. And to your point, right. the LGBTQIA plus community continues to get left behind. So it's kind of hard to tell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Or, or uh, oftentimes it's a subset, right? There's a, there's a little bit of information about same sex couples, which mm-hmm. typically not always, but typically it is for gays and lesbians. It may leave transgender folks out of the, uh, the, the, 
uh, population or intersex individuals, uh, parts mm -hmm. of the community get left out. So I guess that's kind of what, you know, we're curious uh, for your study as well. What was the, what was this meth methodology? How did you mm -hmm find your peoples. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You know, and that that's the fascinating thing about survey data is that if you want to go deeper, even in certain racial demographics like Asian or, or, or Pacific Islander, for example, or Native American, there's so few and you have to pay a lot more money to do those surveys because it costs more to get to that. So I think it's important to understand that there are systemic obstacles to, to getting some of these data. Uh, it's more expensive. There are fewer survey participants. So I think it's essential that we understand that and, to, and talk about how we need more data, better data. Mm -hmm. And so that's my job at NEFI. Uh, I'm called CEO, but it's my job is to assure better data. And this is one of the ways we do that. So we we surveyed a um, thousand, I think it's something like a thousand and five uh, uh, folks. And, and for the sake of your, your podcast and for the sake of brevity, I'm going to say, use the word queer terminology. Um, and uh, so a thousand is a good national you know, uh, benchmark to look at. And so we did that, you know, throughout the spring, but it, um, it took a little longer, quite frankly, to, to collect those that are usually you can do it in a day or two. And it took us several days to get to a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Very well acquainted with that. Yeah. <laughs> It, it isn't easy. And, you know, it's uh, folks, I think we kind of maybe mentioned this a little bit uh, when we did the podcast with Motley Fool, but you're absolutely right. Uh, these studies can get astronomically expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars if you want to co collect a really good sample, a really large sample. And like you said, go go deep into the data. So thank you for, right. for doing that. Right. Well, one of the things that was important to us in the, it's actually 1,050 uh, is the number of folks who did the survey, is that we wanted to also collect some racial demographic. And we, you know, it was 18 years old and older. So it went up basically throughout adulthood. So we have a pretty wide range of ages. But um, it was important to, to look in particular, are queer people of color experiencing this differently than, than, than white or cisgendered uh, queer folks? So that's why we were more intentional with, with collecting the data a little more slowly, if you will. Yeah. Absolutely. And very, very yeah. important too. Yeah. So what were some of the biggest surprises that came from your study? What's the, what are the, what's the headline that came out of this? Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say I was surprised, quite frankly. Um, well, no, I take that back. I was surprised that some of the levels of discrimination or feeling sort of blocked from participation were lower. Uh, than than I expected them to be. So that's promising, right? That mm -hmm. that it's not you know eighty percent uh, of queer people, uh, but the fact that it's twice uh, the general population, the 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 rates of discrimination is troubling. Um, but it, and it's it was general in terms of those who felt blocked or those who just felt discrimination. You know, and we asked those two questions separately. Uh, but a, as a queer community, we we are experiencing this at twice the rate. And then when you look more in, uh, more specifically at uh, the trans community uh, or those who have uh, a gender identity, you know, that's other, um, you know, there's multiples that we looked at. Uh, that rate is almost 60% who were feeling blocked uh, or discriminated against. 57% were, were openly discriminated against and 62% felt blocked by the financial services industry on top of that. So, and that's where my heart really broke, is to look at a population who um, are, uh, face a lot of discrimination in many other ways, and then also just in something as benign as banking or borrowing or credit, that th this is happening at almost four times the rate of the general population. Uh, and when you compare a trans person to sort of a, a cisgendered white male, it, it, you know, it's a quadrupling of discrimination and barriers that they're facing with financial services. And so when you're already probably discriminated against on pay or opportunities or upward mobility, if you will, and then you can't even use these benign products at a, at a way that you feel comfortable or you feel engaged, that is um, a very discouraging to think that these wonderful, beautiful people are not able to uh, participate in the economy in a way that can add more value to their own neighborhoods as well as to the greater society at large. 
Let's talk about that because that parallels mm-hmm. a lot of what surprised David and me about our particular study. And here you are, you're also in the financial services industry. Mm-hmm. You're also a queer person, probably have attended pride parades and nonprofit galas and events. Mm-hmm. And you know, the the financial services industry is trying to connect with the community. If for no reason that they're at, they're at every pride parade, they're at every mm-hmm. non you know they're supporting all of our nonprofits from HRC to the out mm-hmm. out and equal to um, you know the Trevor Project you know innum- innumerable organizations, but there's clearly a disconnect despite that outreach and despite the need that the community mm-hmm. has. Where where, did, where is that where is that gap? Is it ha- is the is the problem? Is a challenge with the frontline workers? Or, or, or do you, or, or what, what, what do you think the, the solution to that is? Well, I, I think there's two or three factors at play here. Um, the first one is let's start with the positive: is that we are making progress. That they're that they're present and they're supporting philanthropic causes that are important to advance advancing equality and equity and inclusion and belonging in in financial services so that that's important and that's good um you know as martin luther king jr said the arc is long uh in in terms of leaning toward justice so it takes time um i think a lot of those on the front lines you know we mentioned the front lines sometimes we don't understand our own uh bias you know the language we use can other people very quickly um and sometimes it's just about training i don't think it is always ill intent uh but sadly sometimes it is uh mm-hmm. you know we've all walked into um uh, an establishment an institution a commercial entity and been ignored or been told you know can can we can we talk about um uh the experience of, you know shopping or or trying to buy a home or a car and then this is as intimate as your personal finances so you're already a little exposed and unnerved with this as it is because there's a lot of shame and baggage and financial drama uh and then you go in and someone um steers you away from products uh because they just assume you don't have the resources or they make assumptions about gender or partnership or or what that looks like um and some of it is nuanced some of it is likely unconscious but some of it isn't and i think it's mm-hmm. training the front line i think it's reimagining the products from a point of view of people who queer people how many times have uh, financial services executives asked queer people what they want. What is the product you want? And, you know, I'm, my heart is as an educator and as an, a scientist. And we we make a lot of assumptions that we we know the questions that should be asked, but we don't ever go into a community and say, what do you want to know about yourselves? What, what products, what would make this work for you? What would make you feel included and sometimes it's just imaging it's presence it's seeing yourself but um there may be this level of richness and insight that's given to the financial services industry about what queer people want and what products we want and how we want it to be represented they cannot think of based on the paradigm that they've worked from for all, for Mm -hmm. all these years so i know that's a gazillion words to say frontline training is important uh representation is important and then asking your customer what it is that they want from the relationship and the products. Right. Yeah, it, it's interesting you bring that up. Um, Kate Anthony, uh, the uh, founder of Euphoria, was on episode 350 of the podcast. And um, Kate brought up the the her experience of walking into a bank and being told, sorry, we don't give loans to people who look like you. Kate is a transgender woman. And, you know, mm-hmm. you, there are obviously, you know, like you said, there are overt examples of this, but mm-hmm. it's interesting the the you, you talked about creating products that are geared towards the queer community. Um, mm-hmm. And the, uh, the simple things like um, voice recognition, right? And those voice recognition tools are trained to define whether or not the person calling is a man or a woman. Mm. Well, that just, I mean, it, it's, it, not only is it incorrect, it's wrong because mm. not everyone sounds like they're either a man or a woman. Yeah, and I've been they, called it, ma'am so many times on the phone. Right. Oh, yeah, I mean, proudly, proudly called ma'am on the phone. Yes. Right. 
it, and you know, you don't have to be a queer person to have a non-informing right. sounding voice. <laughs> right. They're just simply okay with offending people who yeah. may yeah. or may not be queer, right? Mm-hmm. Or may or might may not be gender non-conforming sounding or looking. And the, the, this is this is kind of what your you know, your point here is. You have to be. They have to be a little bit. They, the billions of dollars that they're spending on this kind of. Uh, research and and tools that they're creating to make uh, access to their customers easier and provide the tools that their customers need in some cases without having to ever work with a human being Mm -hmm. they better get better if they want to work with a queer community (laughs) right right exactly and i you know i i say some of this tongue-in-cheek because you know using humor disarms things for me um but i i it's it's very prideful to just assume no matter how what an expert you are in your trade or your industry to assume you have every answer for every customer for every situation just ask find mm-hmm. out what it is ask people what resonates with them and we're not asking for every single customer to have a completely unique niche product necessarily but if you can do that why the hell not <laughs> yeah hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. So I did think it was interesting from your study that roughly 47% of respondents said that their quality of life was what they expected it to be. (laughs) What I'm curious. Double-edged sword, maybe. (laughs) Right. Is is that, is that a good thing or a a bad thing? Um, it's a thing. Um, (laughs) and, and, and so, you know, uh, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to say on this hand and on the other hand, but I am a scientist and I will say that, you know, sometimes how you ask a question can limit you or, or give you more insight. And so the way we asked it is how would you rate the current quality of your financial life? We didn't ask it on a value level. It was just worse than about what you expected or better than. Um, and so only 14% said better than expected. And I don't know if that's because the bar was so low because they had already just experienced sort of right. limited economic opportunities and mobility. Um, so I, I don't know if it's positive or negative, but the fact that where people are is what they expected probably means that certain things haven't surprised them. Mm-hmm. And so surprises and unexpected things can derail you financially. So you know, that part of it, maybe there's a silver lining in, in, in those data. In those data, we probably need to ask that question a little more explicitly um, with that. But I will say that, and, and, you know, I know you've looked at the study with, with about half of people, you know, uh, either right where they thought they would be or a little better. Um, what we do know is that a about 50%, 47 or so percent of people are living paycheck to paycheck according to our data, but um, uh, almost two thirds of queer people are living paycheck to paycheck. So that tells a different story. So when you couple those two um, questions, Mm -hmm. you do see that they're living paycheck to paycheck, but at least they're they have a paycheck and it, and it's, it's like, we've set a lower bar for ourselves, sadly. Right. And that's not the perception. You know, that's not the perception because most people look at uh, the queer community uh, as like the two of you, financially successful, have a good job, you know, you, you, you're you able to make decisions, you know, and I, I was actually doing a thing for CNBC recently, a live Twitter chat, and someone said, uh, gay people don't experience discrimination, all the gay people are rich. And I thought, <laughs> what, what world are you living in? Right. That you have this perception that that all the gay all gay people are like these white male couples who have lots of money and a couple of dogs and a, and a convertible. It is not like that. And so like we need a convertible. Yeah. We don't have a convertible. Yeah. <laughs> no convertible. Yeah, but you can maybe rent one if you save up <laughs> and 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 be fabulous for a weekend, right? Yeah. But you know, oh. you know, we we talk about that particular challenge for the community a lot mm-hmm. on this show. Um, yeah, David and I do fit a, a very. St- to, you know, a stereotype, right? We're a cis white gay couple who had good careers and have decent money. And so we definitely have a very skewed perception of things, which is one of the reasons why we have the podcast because it teaches mm-hmm. us so much. But unfortunately, that's to your point is so much of society, the general population thinks that this 
is who the queer community is. Right. Um, and, and so many other folks are getting left behind. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. why we need to continue to get more data like what Nefi is acquiring, because we need to right. get crystal clear right. that it's, it's actually not that great for all those, for all those people. Um, right. when, you know, you said earlier in the, in the interview, um, when, when did you, when did you conduct this study? It was spring of 2022. Yes. Yes. Uh, we, okay. we collected the data in April. Uh, and I think maybe we went into May a little bit and we released it in June. Okay. So it's pretty timely. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with the rate of inflation, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I wonder if, if those numbers have gotten even worse in the last few months. Probably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So what is, with that, with those two data points, what is, what do you think is the most critical step for financial services or those in financial media to do to give to help to provide triage for the mm. queer community when it comes to its finances, mm. any solutions? Well, I, I mean, we're we're looking at this right now. It's like let let's let's tell the story, let's get the story out there, let's let's debunk the myths, if you will, um, and then start to challenge those who think they're doing a great job. With we we appreciate your progress. You know, I'm an optimist. I'm always going to lean into where there's progress. We appreciate your progress, but there's work to do. And the data are clear here that the financial services industry, uh, for many of us in this community, uh, we have felt blocked. We have felt discriminated against. We have felt that we haven't had access to the full suite of products. And so it's about educating. Um, I'm hoping that getting data like this out into the world and telling the story will cause thoughtful companies and thoughtful providers to disrupt and maybe offer better products, offer more thoughtful um, uh, resources that are that are accessible and that are relatable. And then, you know, if we disrupt that a little bit, then maybe the big the big banks and the big credit unions and the big lenders and the mortgage services uh, will follow that. Or maybe the, the the big giant firms will hear this clearly. You know, you have a wonderful platform. Nefi has a great platform. For goodness sakes, I'm on the CNBC Financial Wellness Council. Let's talk about this so that the right people hear it and then uh, they will ask these thoughtful questions and you know it helps them do better business and it helps elevate um, and propel and provide economic mobility for millions of Americans. So why not do this? Mm -hmm. I have one more thing to add to that. I 100% agree with everything you just said um, and we've been trying to execute on some of that ourselves. But one mm -hmm. thing I would add to it and since you have some connections with those folks over at the CFP board is I would love to see the industry try to recruit more mm -hmm. LGBTQ people specifically mm -hmm. lesbians, trans and bisexual people into yeah. financial services. Yes, Because um, we know I, a couple of years ago I think it was the report was that 50% of financial services, financial advisors were going to retire in the next 10 years or so because mm -hmm. they're just at that age and, and, and life stage. Um, and so the concern is what's going to happen with all those assets mm -hmm. under management, where are they going to go? And I think a great solution is to get more folks from the community mm -hmm. into the industry, um, change the change the perception of what the industry actually is. And we're not actually all, you know, uh, you know, Wall Street trying to trying to be as greedy as possible. Um, mm -hmm. But we're, we're actually doing financial planning, financial coaching, financial counseling, and then it help change the industry from the inside mm -hmm. out as well as from the outside in. Mm -hmm. Right. I, you know, there's also a racial, a huge racial gap in terms mm -hmm. of, of those financial planners. And one of our philosophies at NEFI is that when we do sponsorships or we do charity uh, philanthropy work, you know, giving and 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 so forth, it, we try to do it with a very intentional focus. And that is, for example, we, we gave scholarships to the Association for Financial Counseling and Planning Education uh, to, to credential 100 people of color to become accredited financial counselors. I think yes. financial counseling is the human side of financial planning. You know, I love that that human centric uh, nature. It's not just this objective thing that you're doing over there to maximize profits. It's about helping people understand their financial identity and their financial story. And um, so we did that because there's such a gap. And I think organizations like mine can can 
can ring that bell and say, in addition to uh, accredited financial counselors of color, and, and the reason we did that is that we wanted people to be credentialed in the communities that they live in. We didn't want to perpetuate the savior mentality of swoop in and save the day. We wanted to say, we want to put credentials in your neighborhood. And it's the same with the queer community. Let's, you know, let's, let's remove at least one barrier to get that credential, which would be the cost associated with getting the credential. Um, you know, it's hard enough to study for that and get the books and all the things that go with that and make the time we're all busy. But if, if an organization like mine can remove one of those barriers, you know, we can do that. And that's something we can continue to, to do and support. And instead of um, um, just thinking about doing it once, maybe organizations like mine, or I can talk to others in the field and say, let's, let's all work together. Let's, let's increase those who are serving and let's remove one of the barriers or maybe two or all of the barriers to these credentials so that people can become truly accredited professionals and then serve their neighbors and you can be seen and felt and truly heard. You're not going to hold back. You're going to really open up and tell your story. You're not going to have to gender neutral things and, and be afraid to, 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 to sort of be your best self and live your best financial life at the same time. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's this perception from many people who aren't in the industry that we are all sort of like Gordon Gecko, right? And and mm -hmm. that's kind of the perception that, that people have, unfortunately. And I just think that there's right. so much to your point earlier, there's just so much of a human element that can actually that that needs to actually be applied mm -hmm. to financial planning, counseling, uh, advising. Um, mm -hmm. and our community tends to be very altruistic and wanting to help and mm -hmm. provide valuable services to people in, in a needful way. And who, I mean, who in America doesn't need help with their finances, right? I mean, it's, it's a, right. it's a, right. that's a pandemic in and of itself and not just for the, right. the queer community. And so if the LGBTQ community could provide that, we could not only marry um, providing people with the type of uh, fulfillment that they're looking for from a career, but also marry mm -hmm. that couple that with, you know, a well-paying job that can help our, our, our community itself reach financial security. So I would love to see more of that ourselves. Right. You, um, Net Nefi found that 45% of respondents to your study haven't had the opportunity to take financial education courses mm -hmm. or training in either school, workplace, one on one uh, counseling. Doesn't that strike you as shocking? I mean, we, we spend mm -hmm. so much money trying to help kids go to college and earn as much money as possible to get these great, lavish mm -hmm. careers, right? To have mm -hmm. supposedly some sort of financial security, but we don't help them with how to balance a checkbook, with how to, how mm -hmm. do you purchase your first stock? Like, doesn't that just, mm -hmm. that surprise you? Yeah. I mean, it, it surprises me because even, even those who have had uh, financial education, some of it has been haphazard. Some of it has been with people who don't really understand the topic themselves. They think they're good because maybe they have a good paycheck or maybe because there's an aspect of personal finance. So this sense of quality also needs to be understood. And, and not only quality, but inclusivity and feeling seen and represented within financial education. You know, a lot of us come to, and, and Chloe McKenzie is an, an amazing writer and, and a researcher who's been writing about uh, the financial trauma of Black women. And um, I think a lot of queer people have the same experience or a similar experience uh, in terms of bringing financial trauma to the table. And I think people resist financial education because they don't want to feel shamed. They don't want to feel finger pointed. Um, and I, the irony that I am the president and CEO of the largest fin ed research nonprofit in the country, and I still have that baggage when I walk into a room occasionally, <laughs> is not lost yes. on me. Yeah. You know, so if I can feel it, I know it's present in people who don't live this every day. And so I think there's reasons that people don't embrace it as adults when they when they have an opportunity to embrace it, if it's offered and they choose not to. And then there's a whole section of people that have never been offered. But if you are feeling traumatized by it or feeling shamed by it. You know, I went to a private liberal arts college. I had student loan debt. All I've heard is the shame and the finger pointing and, oh my God, student loan debt, student loan debt. But that was an opportunity for me. I was a poor kid in Appalachia. I had to have means to go. And what we don't discuss in financial education is that um, 
from the terms of what I get, what was gained from that, that that's mm-hmm. what I needed at that point in my life is a small environment that where I felt that I could build the cultural capital to then eventually have the real financial capital. Uh, and we don't talk about it that way. It's just like a, a tips and do's and don'ts and finger pointing and you did this wrong and do this. And I, I think that does not, uh, uh, that is not appealing to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and then when you look at the K-12 fin ed, and we've gotten much better, I will say, in terms of sort of starting to cre- how to create more culturally relevant financial education. We have a long way to go, but we've, we've come forward some. And when you look at who is even offered this, it's not equal. It depends on what school you went to, what zip code mm-hmm. you grew up in. And so we're not creating generations of people who are uh, educated and then will ad- um uh, advocate and demand for better products and better financial services because they haven't been given a foundational experience. Uh, thankfully, many states, Ohio, where you now are, is one of those that has a requirement. I think it goes into effect. It may have maybe this actually this school year that every student has to have a semester of financial education. So we're making inroads and but People are still going to resist it if it's not inclusive, it's not been thoughtfully designed, people don't feel seen and heard. It's not about your 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 life goals and your conversations. It's more about follow this tip and boring, mundane, you know, personal finance is not value free mm-hmm. at all. And I said that hey, that was a good pun, actually. <laughs> uh, 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 I'm so clever. I'm so We're proud of myself. We're going to see that in a CNBC yeah. article in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, but but you know, it, it it it's just latent with sort of your what you bring to the table and, and what you want to achieve in life and 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 let's put the human first. And if we're going to do that well, then that means queer humans, that means black and brown humans. You know, I, so that's our goal at NEPI is to is to advocate for those who don't have this um, and encourage employers to offer it, encourage uh, community centers. You know. Just communities of faith, uh, community centers themselves to to offer this and do pro bono work. There's all kinds of uh, opportunities for it, but it has to be effective. And by that, it has to be inclusive. Otherwise, people will not take advantage of it or not, uh, not select in. I'm going to add something else. I think that the, the value level of it needs to be raised. We yeah. put so much value and emphasis on education, on Mm -hmm. becoming wealthy, on success, having lots of followers. I mean, kids today, they don't want to grow up to be the the sports stars or the things that they used. They all want to be uh, influencers now, right? Mm -hmm. They they want to have a million followers, right? But the, the value of what a good financial education can do for somebody who's earning an everyday income Mm -hmm. can propel them financially far beyond people who earn double what they make, triple what they make. And we, you know, mm-hmm. we say this over and over again. We know people who are making $50,000 a year who have more money in their retirement travel mm-hmm. better than people who make two, three, four times as much. And mm-hmm. their their life is has a hell of a lot less stress to it. But mm-hmm. we just don't provide that or put that out there as something truly mm-hmm. valuable. And I don't know how we actually do that, but I think mm-hmm. it's it, it's important to, to kind mm-hmm. of explain that to, to young mm-hmm. people, especially in the, you know, it kind of goes back to the, that old adage of it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. And how do we put the value on how much you keep and make mm-hmm. that important? Why, why is it how much you keep and how do you learn how to much, how much you keep? So. Yes. Yes. My grandfather used to say uh, before he passed that um, your value is not associated with your bank account. Yeah. And this was a man who was grew up very poor and then ended up being very successful. Um, uh, so it was never about the money. It was about being able to make choices for him yeah, and his so. family and his children. So always, yeah. always. I love that. So what would you like the queer community to do with this data? How would you like us to respond to do next? Yeah. Um, first of all, um, to know you're not alone in feeling this, you know, to know that others are experiencing this, uh, to know that hopefully you take comfort in knowing that there are organizations trying to improve this work and some of the unsexy things we're doing, like 
surveys, data, you know, that can inform practice. So hopefully you're encouraged by that. And just know that that those of us who have a platform are um, working to, to try to get help bring your voice to the table. Not my voice, not Billy's voice, but your voice. And, um, you know, that's just a personal thing that I feel in my, in my heart. Um, I, I think more of us in this industry are starting to become aware of how we've poorly served. And, and so hopefully you will see that, 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 financial education in general, but also financial services begins to change and evolve to better suit your needs. And I would say advocate for what you need, ask for better products. Um, and if you don't feel served by uh, the financial institutions that you're currently affiliated with, there are others who can likely serve you better. So shop around. And that's that's an old school, fin ed, you know, shop around. You probably have said this many times on this podcast. Um, but there's there's other reasons to shop around beyond uh, the financial terms. Uh, it's also about um, uh, who, who do you want to do business with? Um, and think about it like that. And there are people in your corner and trying to advocate. And uh, hopefully we've started the snowball down the hill and it'll just continue to grow and the momentum will be felt and you'll start to see that in practice. That, that, that's my hope. Uh, but, but feel empowered by the data and use the data to make the case. You know, go in and say, listen, this community is not being served and I'd love to discuss this. And what, you know, what can we do uh, to, to, to do a better job? Absolutely. I love that. Then my follow-up question, I think you already answered it in the last one, but I've got to answer it anyway. What should the financial services industry now do with this information? Um, listen to your clients. Listen to your clients. Listen to your clients. Um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of purchasing power. There's a lot of influence, but there's also a lot of good you can do as a corporate citizen um, by listening to your clients. So there's an interesting you have to rule ask. In the, yeah. <laughs> sorry. There's an interesting rule in the financial services industry called know your customer. <laughs> mm. Maybe we need to dive a little bit deeper into what that yeah. means. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and you're just because your largest customer base happens to be cis white guys doesn't mean mm -hmm. you have fulfilled knowing your customer by only serving cis white guys. Right. That's so, one profile. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then what does uh, Nefi plan on doing? What's uh, what's what's next with this information that you have? Mm. Well, we'll continue to talk about it to anyone who will listen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I've, I've done several interviews. I'm, I'm speaking at academic type conferences. We're trying to keep this out there so that hopefully it inspires a more robust research agenda by the sort of the, the academic nerdy type researchers, as well as better polling, better data. Um, we're actually going to, NEFI is investing um, in our research agenda to um, spend more to get better samples, meaning we want more voices heard in the data. Um, and, and so that's something we're doing, but we're also um, doing the, you know, I jokingly always call it the unsexy work of fin ed, but even like the measures of financial literacy, like the surveys that tell you, are you financially literate or are you, do you have a lot of financial knowledge? We're actually testing those for cultural relevancy. And so that's not something that's ever going to get a headline necessarily, but what we what we will do is hopefully improve on the data we do collect on the financial health of uh, of, of Americans uh, in general or those who live in the U.S., um, but also who those people are, not just cater to the average, you know, not just cater to what does the mean say, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's this whole like clump of folks in this group that get washed away by the mean. Mm -hmm. So let's let's pull them out and look more more specifically at their experience. And does asking the question this way actually cause people to look less financially literate than they really are? So we want better representation, better data. And some of that's sort of boring technical things. And some of it is just awareness and putting the word out there. So we will continue to try to give voice to queer people and 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 others, many others, people of color in particular as well. Um, uh, over the next few years. And hopefully the research agenda gets better because we have better data. I love that. Love that. So where else can our listeners, uh, how else can they connect with NEFI and get more information on this particular study? 
Sure. Well, our website is a quick way to get you know data and see what we're doing, what we're talking about. It's nefe.org, uh, and you can follow Nefi on Twitter uh, at nefi underscore org, or you can follow me at Dr. Billy Hensley. Um, and you know, all of our data, all of our resources, all of our talking points uh, are always pushed out constantly. So if you're an advocate in your community, use the data. Uh, and if you're just a just a general consumer, use the data to advocate for yourself. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, and I, I'll, I'll throw that. Share it, right? I mean, share this data. Yes, with yes. with other people in the community because it may not be uh, surprising some of the data points to us, those of us who are kind of sitting in this space, right? But to folks out in the community who may be doing something completely different, you know, to the hairstylist, to the construction mm -hmm. worker, to the farmer, to all of those people in the queer community who aren't necessarily in it on a regular mm -hmm. basis, they may look at that, at some of that data and say, I, I have no clue. I don't understand. Right. It, may, it doesn't, or I will say also for those of us who sit in places of privilege, it may be a smack upside the head to say, hey, pay attention to what's going on for the rest of the folks in the community. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hensley, for giving us your time and coming on our show and talking about this great study. Uh, David and I will continue to dive into it and do what we can on our part to share it as much as possible because mm -hmm. we think this is a very critical conversation for the community to have. And so as many partners and resources as we can include in that, the better. So thank you for your time. Yeah. And thank you too. You're doing great work for, for all of us and you're appreciated uh, from afar and from near, I'm sure. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode. Here's your quick money takeaway from this one. If lack of financial information is your challenge, take the first step that many of us did to get smart about money. Go to your local library, either in person or through the free Libby app, and check out a book on personal finance. Some of our recommendations include Get Good With Money by Tiffany Aliche, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, how to Money by recent Queer Money podcast guests Gene Chatsky and Catherine Tuggle, and one of our all-time favorite books, The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Klassen. Then join us Thursday for another bonus episode, and next Tuesday when we talk with wives Hannah and Juliet, participants on the new PBS show Opportunity Knocks, about their experience being on the show and learning how to money on national television. Thank you, and have a great week. Mm -hmm.